In this course, I've been talking about clinical depression and the various types and categories of mood problem that appear in the diagnostic manual. I've alluded to the fact that depression is not rare. But who gets it? And how common is it? Is it becoming more or less common? And how much does it cost our society? These are really questions about depression's epidemiology. And that's the subject of this lecture. First, who gets depression? Well, the main answer to that question is anyone can get depression. If we did a really evil experiment and took complete control over people's lives, what they ate, what happened in their lives, how isolated they were, how much exercise they got, and so on, we think we could make anyone depressed. Of course, no one is ever going to fund a study like that, so we'll never really know. But we suspect that all humans are capable of experiencing depression. And of course, that just begs the question, who's more likely to get it? Well, that brings us close to the question of what causes depression. And in my book, Your Depression Map, I had three complete chapters on this issue. So I'm not going to go there in this course. Instead, I'll just focus on two issues gender and age of onset. First, the gender ratio. There's a general consensus among practitioners and researchers alike that more women than men experience clinical depression. Now, this question has been researched over and over again from all different angles, and the data keep coming up the same way. Major depression is one of the most common psychological difficulties that men face. And it's even more common in women. The ratio varies from study to study, but it appears to be something around two to one, women to men. Now, some people wonder about that. Lots of men won't even tell someone when they're lost driving. How likely are they to walk into a doctor's office and say, oh, I've been having this serious mood problem and I, I can't deal with it myself? So maybe men are just as depressed as women, but more women show up for help. No, that's not it. Researchers have controlled for this and the gender split shows up anyway. It seems to be a real thing. In the case of bipolar disorder, by the way, the ratio is very, very near one to one. All right, then. When is someone likely to get major depressive disorder for the first time? Answer, depression can appear any time in a person's life, from childhood to extreme old age. The most common time of life for first onset, though, is in the 20s. But does that mean that it's unlikely later on? No. There seems to be a bit of a peak in the 20s, but first appearances elsewhere in the lifespan are common. This is unlike schizophrenia, for example, where the most common age of onset is 19 or so for males and 25 or so for females. And a first appearance after the age of 40 is quite rare. One reason to celebrate your 40th birthday is that you're pretty well leaving the risk period for schizophrenia onset. Unfortunately, you're not leaving behind the possibility of depression. Now, are those the only two predictors of who gets it, age and gender? No. There are dozens of risk factors, and I'll be talking about those in another course. But for now, let's shift to another question. How common is depression? The short answer is very common. You can imagine that this kind of question is a bit difficult to answer. We have to assess thousands of people properly sampled, but we do have a fairly good idea. The number of people who experience major depressive disorder in their lifetime appears to be about 5 to 9 percent of males and 10 to 25 percent of females. And the number who are in a major depressive episode in any given year is about 2 to 3% for males and 5 to 9% for 
for females. This makes depression one of the most common psychological difficulties that people experience, and it appears to affect people across the full range of humanity, all social groups, all classes, all races, all languages. There may be some differences between groups in terms of how common it is, but we have not found a group of people who are immune to it. What about other mood problems? Well, compared to major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder is less common. Estimates put the lifetime prevalence at 0.4 to 1.6% for bipolar 1 disorder and around half a percent for bipolar 2 disorder. The prevalence of dysthymia is quite unclear, but most estimates place it at under 2% of the population and cyclothymia affects 0.4 to 1% of people. Next, what does depression cost? It's clear that depression affects a huge number of people. We're used to thinking of it in terms of human suffering, but it also costs money. Here are some of the expenses. Increased doctor visits. For especially severe cases, hospitalization medication costs, psychotherapy and support, work absenteeism, lost productivity, short and long-term disability costs, and the increased costs of physical illnesses. There is some evidence that untreated depression makes a person more vulnerable to a variety of physical illnesses as well. There are more price tags on depression as well as these, but you get the idea. The World Health Organization has looked at the impact of depression on society, and they use a measure called the Disability Adjusted Life Year, the DALI. A DALI is a year of productive life lost to premature death or to disability, and they've tabulated the DALIs attributable to various illnesses. Worldwide, here are the results. The number one cause of DALIs, not depression, lower respiratory tract infections, followed by diarrheal diseases, then unipolar depression, meaning major depression, but this does not include bipolar disorder. So worldwide, depression is a major cause of productive years lost. Most of those years are lost to disability rather than to death because the vast, vast majority of people with depression do not end their lives. But look at those causes. In developed countries, some of those ailments are much less common. So what if we restrict the analysis to developed market economies? Respiratory tract disorders, diarrheal diseases, and HIV AIDS drop off the list, and depression moves to the top. So depression doesn't just cost a lot to treat, it also costs the economies of those countries a huge amount. Now I'm most concerned with the human impact of depression, but governments also look at the costs of various problems, and depression appears to cost them more than heart disease, or frankly, almost anything else. In my country, Canada, most workers have disability insurance. So if you can't work, most of your salary is still covered. And you can guess that the companies that provide that insurance are very, very interested to know where they're having to spend that money. So they keep track. And among the largest insurers, there is a consensus that major depressive disorder is either the number one or number two cause of long-term disability in the country. In the United States, it's estimated that clinical depression costs the economy about $83 billion every year. That's $265 per citizen every year. In mental health, we often feel like a secondary priority next to physical health. We don't cure cancer. We don't do heart transplants, but in fact, we're treating a problem 
that costs much more than most or maybe any of those physical disorders. Now, depression costs a lot. Is it becoming more common? Well, you'd think that this would be a very easy question to answer, but it isn't. For one thing, the diagnostic criteria change a little bit over time. Major depressive disorder, according to DSM-5, includes more people than the criteria that were in DSM-3. As well, research methods tend to change over time. We're better at identifying depression than we used to be. So that can make it look like depression is becoming more common. But if you control for that, is it still becoming more common? Well, it's possible to argue both sides. But most researchers seem to feel that yes, depression is becoming more common. And if it is, we might ask, why? Well, that's a complicated question, and it relates to the various causes of depression, which, as I've said, I'll cover in another program. But I'll give you some hints. Poor diet and nutrition. This is a known risk factor for depression, and diets appear to be getting poorer. Decreasing levels of physical fitness. We know that poor physical fitness is a risk factor for depression. Isolation. This appears to be increasing, particularly among young people. And there are a variety of other factors associated with modern culture, like consumerism, a weakening of family bonds, a decline in the ability to accept and expect adversity in life, changes in the expectations for the future, given a difficult economy, and for many people, a sense of lack of meaning and purpose in their lives. All these and more might help explain why depression is so common in our culture and why it may be increasing. Whether it's increasing or not, it's very common. You are almost certainly affected by it, either yourself or in someone that you know well.